Hi, I'm Jeff Vandermeer, the author of Hummingbird Salamander, a new eco-thriller about a woman who receives a strange gift of taxidermy and goes down a rabbit hole of surveillance, paranoia, and the possible end of the world. I'm so happy to be able to interview Lisa Flanagan, who voiced the uh, audiobook for Hummingbird Salamander so superbly and wonderfully well. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, one question I have is... How do you usually prepare to voice an audiobook like Hummingbird Salamander? Do you read it aloud to yourself or read it silently? Do you take notes as you're reading? I'm just really curious what that process looks like. I generally read through silently the first time, uh, sometimes stopping here and there to try out voices. And as I go, I will mark on my script on my iPad um, any physical, vocal descriptions, attributions like that, as well as marking up unfamiliar scientific foreign words that stick out that I want to check on later. One thing I also do when it's a mystery or a thriller like Hummingbird Salamander, I will read the first 50 pages or so, and then I'll skip to the last 50 pages. And I will not understand a lot of things that come my way, but it allows me to read that and go back to the start and keep an eye out for the payoffs and keep in mind uh, what clues, hints, and foreshadowing might be coming and who knew what when, uh, which can really matter for books like this. So one thing I loved about the initial sample I heard from you for Hummingbird Salamander was it had this great balance between a kind of baseline of narration of the story, but then there was the rise and fall of intensity along that baseline. And I I wonder how you think about the conveyance of emotion in what you read so that there is emotion, but there's also the absence of it when there needs to be. It's funny. You talk about the conveyance of emotion, but also the absence when there needs to be. And for my part, and I think for your book in particular, it had such a strong point of view. I didn't find that much of an absence of emotion because this is someone who really has something to say to you, Jane. And I think for my part, I come from a musical background. I trained as an opera singer, and there's the gesture. There's where the phrase is going, and sometimes that phrase is a whole paragraph, and sometimes that musical phrase or that that gesture is a whole page. Sometimes it feels like colors, and sometimes it feels like light and very cinematic to me, and I just tune into those. I think it would be a disservice if every word had such meaning and such weight, but really my job is to make sure that every word feels like it belongs there. This might be a simple question, I suppose, but it's it's important to me because uh, I love to write, and that's what sustains me. So I'm curious, what do you most enjoy about doing audiobooks? I just love long-form storytelling. I always loved books. You know, I grew up loving books and words. And audiobooks is just this amazing joining of those two parts of my life, of me as a performer and me as a, a bibliophile. And that chance to just craft a whole world for someone. Can you give me just a little snapshot into the process of creating an audiobook? Um, I assume you do not read continuously for hours and hours until it's done, because I think that would be beyond the call of duty. But I am curious what the process looks like. Well, first you climb into a cramped, badly ventilated box and then read continuously for hours on end. Well, no, but sort of. No, a lot of it is just reading for hours on end. Uh you got to be able to pace yourself. you got to make sure you get out and stretch and hydrate and stretch. Um, Because it's interesting, in this form of performance, you can't move a lot. Uh, They don't see your face. They don't know if you're making faces. I mean, they can hear it sometimes. You can always hear these movements. But um, you often can't take the physical qualities that you might want to as a performer. I do a lot of um, kind of hands moving in the air and and flexing and wiggling of fingers because it allows me to uh, create a sense of movement in something where I have to often be very, very still. So, yeah, you sit in the box. um, You make sure there's no background noise, no outside noise bleeding in. Um, 
you record, I self-record, so I'm also running the computer, and I stop when I make a mistake, and I put the cursor right before the mistake, and I start rolling again. Um, then you break it into files, and you send it off to the publisher. And uh, a couple days or weeks later, they send you back all the things you said wrong because you were either too caught up or you're, you know, kind of dyslexic or whatever. Have you ever lost yourself in a book you're voicing, even though, of course, I know it's you're in a very conscious way, the person conveying the words to the audience. But do you ever find yourself forgetting that it's a book? I have absolutely lost myself in books. I think this was also a book where I very much lost myself. And that costs in certain ways because you end up when you're really in a performance, you have more slip ups and uh, mistakes that make it past your consciousness. And a uh, special shout out to the engineer, Raymond Scully, who caught so many of them and was wonderfully generous and patient with all of them. But for me, I'm still largely aware that someone's listening. Sometimes it's imagining that I'm back to back with whoever I'm telling this story to, whoever my listener is. They can't see anything that's going on and I have to make them understand all of it and feel all of it. And sometimes it's catching yourself when you're just reading words and backing up and saying, this is all true. I believe all of this because I'm in this story. Does it help or hurt or is it just a neutral thing in terms of voicing a book to have some point of personal connection uh, to the viewpoint character? I think it can absolutely cut both ways. I've had books after I lost my mother that were incredible to go through and connect with a character that has lost a parent and some that were really trying. You can be really frustrated with how a main character feels about themselves or talks about something. And you sometimes end up with main characters who have sometimes very ugly views, and that's part of the journey of their character, and you're getting through it. And you're going to feel a certain way, but you can't let your performance become editorializing. And keeping in mind that line where you're enriching a performance versus reinventing what's on the page can sometimes get blurry. Now, I want you to be honest, Lisa. Were there any times you were cursing me, the author, while recording the audiobook of Hummingbird Salamander? It's totally okay. I would understand. Uh, I, I can think of two moments. The first is discovering the tweet that revealed after almost an hour of research trying to find the proper pronunciation that the Latin taxonomical name of one of the animals, or I think both animals maybe, uh, was invented by a biologist for your book, which is fascinating and wonderful. But I was going mad trying to figure out how to say this word properly. And uh, the second instance I can think of was a really fantastic scene where two characters face off across a bridge and are demonstrably and repeatedly shouting to each other the entire time. And as a person who's working with a very sensitive mic next to me, who still wants to honor what's been written on the page and the effort and the vibe of what these characters and how they're relating to each other, it's a balancing act. So, you know, tiny expletive right there, but nothing bad. Now it's time for a presumptuous question. Uh, I'm curious if there was a favorite bit for you of having voiced Hummingbird uh, Salamander. I guess I just hope that there was like a moment or a scene or something. Absolutely. And the book had so many wonderful scenes. But for me, I read the ending of the book three or four times because I loved it. Because uh, the heroine found herself in a place that was very unexpected. But also, you find out where she is that she's telling you this whole story from and why she's telling you. The main character in a thriller or a noir is that kind of person who is gritty and hard-boiled and tough, but they're also the person who is compelled to tell you this. And so as a performer, I have to view them as almost the most vulnerable person in the entire story because they're laying themselves bare. So that last 20, 30 pages where we're in the space with her, we're in her present, in this amazing 
environment, this amazing setting. I loved that. Absolutely loved it. This may seem like blasphemy, but I've often wished the audiobook narrator could change some of the text in my novels for the audio experience, in part because, you know, I conceive of some of my novels as being meant to be read aloud and others, uh, you know, maybe to be read on the page first. And so I'm going to ask if you have a scene or a moment in Hummingbird Salamander that you would have liked to have tweaked for the audiobook? I can honestly say I wouldn't change a thing, but I will also remind you that we did tweak it. The book has a little bit of cryptography, sort of, and a visual cue that shows up in the text that relates and plays out in scenes later, but you can't really characterize that in audio all the time. So sometimes text-based visuals are a tricky to convert to audio. And also, uh, I think there was a moment we had text messages where we didn't know who was texting who yet. And so you have to still be a voice that's relevant without giving that away. And that's always a challenge. But I love that part of my job. I love navigating those challenges. Thank you so much, Lisa. I I really appreciate it you taking the time to do this. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it, too. Inside, they sat me down at the kitchen table. I could feel every one of my injuries screaming at me. I'd put too much strain on my body. Thought my strength made me invincible. Now I would pay, and keep paying. The kitchen table was different. A remodeled kitchen, bright and cheery like one of my husband's real estate listings with a chipper blue backsplash and stainless steel stovetop along with light rosewood cabinets.